One. It is such a joy to see you in church today. What a beautiful day it is to worship and to celebrate God's love. If you are joining us for the first time, I want to say I'm in the middle of a sermon series about baptism and what does baptism mean to us as Christians today. My sermon today is, call, is entitled, Called to a New Lifestyle. When we are baptized, we are called to a new lifestyle. And so my question to you right off the bat is something I want you to think about. What makes the Christian lifestyle different than everybody else? I'm going to say that again. What makes the Christian lifestyle different than everybody else? What impact does our religion have on the way we live our daily lives? And when you're thinking about this answer, uh, by way of comparison, I want you to consider an Orthodox Jew, for example. An Orthodox Jew knows that being a part of the Jewish faith, Jewish religion, it changes one's lifestyle dramatically. When you're an Orthodox Jew, you dress differently than everybody else. You act differently than everybody else. You eat differently than everybody else. You wash your hands differently than everybody else. If you're an Orthodox Jew in our society today, you can be spotted a mile away by the clothes you're wearing, the behavior you're exhibiting, because you know that your religion has imposed a brand new lifestyle upon you. Life is not the same when you embrace the religion as an Orthodox Jew would embrace that religion. So I ask you, what difference does it make in our behavior as baptized Christians? Do we dress differently than everybody else? No. When's the last time you saw me going into Walmart dressed like this? Right? So we don't, we don't dress differently unless maybe you're a nun. And even nuns are blending in with society. Remember years ago, nuns would wear the typical black and white outfit and they wear the habit and everything. And uh, by the way, there are a bunch of nuns who live at, uh, at the Catholic school here, Morris Catholic they live right on the campus there. And one day, I'm, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just describing what it looked like. They, 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 they're traditional nuns. They're old-fashioned nuns. The door opened up, and it looked like a bunch of penguins were coming out the front door. It was unbelievable. And again, I'm not criticizing. I thought it was amazing that there are still orders of nuns who dress like the traditional nuns do. But what I'm saying is, when you're a Christian, do you wear things differently? Well, maybe you put a cross around your neck or something like that. That's part of your lifestyle, perhaps. What about foods? You know, as a Christian, do you, do you go down the, the aisle of your grocery store? Let's say you're at ShopRite and you're saying, gee, I wonder if God wants me to have peanut butter this week. Or, uh, and the closest we have to that, by the way, is the Catholic restriction on having meat on Fridays. Remember years ago, that was a very strict rule. No meat on Fridays, and especially during Lent. Oh, no, you don't ever have a hot dog on a Friday. Don't do it. Well, they're getting uh, looser on that rule too, right? What I'm saying is, what about our religion? What, what difference does it make in our lifestyle? Again, the Orthodox Jews, they're totally different in the way they live their lives. Does that apply to us? I bring this up for a reason. Because in the first reading for today, we go all the way back to the first century, all the way back to the days of Jesus. And the, the Jews of that day took their religion seriously. They took everything they did seriously. They had rules and regulations they had prohibitions here. They had rituals over there. If you read the book of Leviticus, which is part of the Hebrew scriptures, Leviticus details over a thousand different rules and regulations. Yeah, 
all about how to wash your hands, all about how to pray, all about what food you should be eating. This was in the days of Jesus. Now, a lot of those Jews accepted Jesus as their Messiah. So they said, okay, we're going to leave our Jewish religion, we're going to leave our Hebrew-based religion, and now accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But then they said, well, we're still going to do the rituals, the hand-washing, and we're going to do the prayers, and we're going to do this and that and the other thing. And Paul said, you don't have to do that anymore. Are you kidding? We, we're going to discard all of our Jewish traditions because we've accepted Jesus? Yeah. You don't have to do all those rituals anymore. Well, why not? Well, Paul said, you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And Paul said that when Jesus went to the cross and when he rose from the dead, he fulfilled the requirements of all the Jewish law. Jesus fulfilled the price. That's why Christians don't have to worry about what foods are kosher and what foods are not kosher. And God forbid if you have a cheeseburger. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're a dedicated Jew, you're not allowed to have a cheeseburger because you're not allowed to mix dairy products with beef. But they said all that goes away now. Jesus has taken care of all that. He's fulfilled the law. You are free to live as baptized Christians. And they still couldn't understand it. They said no. This is too easy. We want to follow the Jewish laws, the Jewish regulations that we, we were taught since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for crying out loud. And, and Paul said, don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You are free to be in Christ. Imagine. That's why now we don't have to worry about these ancient Hebrew laws and restrictions and do this and don't do that. We're free. And baptism sets us free as people of God. 38 years ago, I was a seminary student. Fred, the days of seminary. And in seminary, there's this class where they teach you how to do Holy Communion, like how to do the, the liturgy and the ritual. They tell you stuff like, don't forget to hold up the chalice and say, this is my blood, you know, this is the new covenant. And right in the middle of a class, one of the students raised her hand and she said, well, after I hold up the chalice, do I turn this way or do I turn that way? What, what's the technical appropriate way to do this? And I'll never forget the answer. The answer from the seminary professor was, it doesn't matter whether you turn this way or that way, God still loves you. There was a huge burden placed upon the ancient Jews. They were afraid that if they turned the wrong way, they would be condemned. That if they didn't say the proper prayers, they would be condemned. If they didn't wash their hands appropriately according to ritual, they would be condemned. If they mix the wrong foods, if they ate inappropriate food, then God is going to send hellfire and brimstone upon them. They would be condemned. The ancient Jews were afraid of God to the point where they were afraid to breathe. If they breathed the wrong way, they would insult God. What a way to live. I'll tell you a little story about something that happened. This is spelled out in the book of Leviticus, the Hebrew Scripture. If you were very sick back in those days, but you thought you were over the illness, let's say you had the flu, and now you say, I don't have the flu anymore, I'm fine. You had to go to the rabbi, and the rabbi had to pronounce you clean and healed again. But in order to pronounce you clean, you had to go through a ritual. Check this out. You had to take two living birds. You kill one of the birds, and you take the blood of the, of the killed bird and you sprinkle the other bird that is still alive until you get blood splattered on the bird. Then you let the living bird free to fly away with the blood of the dead bird on it. Then you go into the river and you have to wash yourself seven times in the water of the river. Step out, 
Go back in, wash yourself seven more times, step out. Turn this way, walk back in, wash yourself seven times, go out. Turn that way, wash yourself seven times, do the hokey pokey and it's been, you know, it's all there. Now, I'm not criticizing the practice as much as I'm saying they took their law seriously. Oh, but there's more. After you wash yourself and kill birds and turn around and do the hokey pokey, you go back to the priest and you say to the priest, well, am I healed? Am I clean? And the priest goes, ah, it's not that simple that the rabbi the rabbi says, it's not that simple. Now you have to go outside of town, pitch a tent, and live there for seven days. You are not allowed to go back into society until the seven days are up. Then come back and see me again. And then, then I'll determine whether you're fit to re-enter society. First thing I thought was, man, they got a lot of sick days back in those days when, when they were working. In, in this day and age, you know what it's like if you work for the big corporation, you get the, 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 the employee manual and they tell you how many sick days you're allowed to have, right? And tell me you didn't play this game. Oh my goodness, I only have two more sick days left and it's only June. What am I going to do now? I don't want to use all my sick days. I don't want to eat into my vacation. I'm not going to take personal days. What am I supposed to do? And so you go back to work while you're still sick, and then you infect everybody in the office. Wonderful, right? Well, these ancient Hebrews would say, no, God doesn't want you anywhere near anybody else. You camp outside for seven days, then come back. Here's the point I'm making. Everything was spelled out in detail the way you're supposed to live, the way you're supposed to work, the way you're supposed to pray, the way you're supposed to worship. It's all spelled out in detail. And everybody was walking around saying, I am so afraid to offend God because if I make one mistake, I'm done. I'm toast. I'm history. Paul said, don't worry about it anymore. Jesus died for your sins. And Jesus loves you even when you screw up. Jesus loves you. If you turn the wrong way, you'll still be forgiven. And that's what baptism is all about. Baptism sets us free to live joyful lives, not lives of fear and caution. Baptism sets us apart to live free, to be generous and to be open with others. Jesus himself said, let your light shine. Don't worry about how your light is shining. And you know what? Once in a while, your light isn't going to be shining. Once in a while, you're going to drop the flashlight. Once in a while, you're going to stumble and fall. But God still loves you. This is the point. You are baptized into the grace, love, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. He loves you. If you make a mistake, don't dwell on it. Ask for the renewal of your spirit and then move on. Don't constantly beat yourself over the head. Oh, I made the wrong turn. I did this wrong. I said the wrong thing. No, God loves you. And baptism is a sign of that love. You don't have to be perfect in order to be loved by God. That's the message of the New Testament. Let your light shine. You are baptized to be as generous as you can without fear. You are baptized to be as loving as you can without fear. You are baptized to be gracious and not constantly looking over your shoulder wondering if the next lightning bolt is intended for you. No, God loves you too much for that. God sent His only begotten Son to die for your sins and my sins. That says a lot, doesn't it? God knows we're going to mess up now and then. God knows we're going to forget the rules. God knows we're going to just stumble and fall. But you know what God says? God says, I will lift you up. I will renew your spirit. I will give you new life again. And you can, you can march proudly and graciously and faithfully into the future because you don't have to be afraid. I love you. And I always will.
So all I'm saying is the next time you get overly critical of yourself, the next time you're wondering if God will ever forgive you, I'm telling you right now, you are a child of the Most High God. God loves you with your faults and your shortcomings. God loves you warts and all. God loves you when you stumble and fall. And He says, I believe you can get back up again and make a difference. May that gracious God bless you now and forever. Amen. And may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>